We're live. We're live. I think. Let me. <laughs> oh check. my goodness. Yes. Let me check the page real quick. I, I hope we have. Oh yeah! Look at all these people. What's up? How's cool. everyone doing? I'm I'm so excited that that we got a lot of people on. It's gonna be a great night. Yeah, we've got Scott Levy here. We got Anna, uh, S. Victoria, Mike Sang, Jack. What's up? It's starting right now, my friend. We got Betty, uh, Alex, Dean, David, Sabina, Michael uh, from from a lot of different places: Pennsylvania, California, Seattle. Uh, everybody, welcome and thank you so much for uh, joining us. Oh, my hair, God. Thank you so much for joining us at uh, Tennis Summit 2019. This is the kickoff party, and I'm really happy to have my great friend, Peter Freeman, one of the best and uh, biggest hearted people in the business. Uh, Pete, say hi. What's up? Hello. This is exciting because I see so many people. Like you mentioned, Scott Levy. I talked to him the other day on the phone. Dottie, we talked today. I mean, it's pretty awesome to see everybody, and uh, I'm looking so forward to this. Tennis Summit is a great event. You know, it's not easy, as I know from doing Tennis Con, to get all these amazing coaches to, you know, uh, come up with great topics for y'all and take y'all to the next level. So great job again, Maravon. Thanks so much. And uh, yeah, I mean, today, really excited to talk about a few things. I mean, first, we're going to talk about uh, actually our top 10 tips to help you become uh, winning competitive tennis players. And we're also going to give you the skinny on the summit as well uh, to see what's in store for you all to uh, and how you can improve your games. And we've got a lot, a lot of great things coming. So, uh, yeah, I mean, Pete, do you have anything to add to uh, today's topic as far as what we're going to cover? Well, I'm fired up. I want to learn all about the summit as well. Um, and and because I am curious, one of the things that I love about, you know, doing this kind of thing that, that you've done is I find, and I want to ask you what you think, is I find that I become a better coach, uh, more knowledgeable about the game, because almost every time uh, you interview somebody, you, you get at least one or two things that you go, wow, that was like really good. I, I should I should be using that. Would you say that that's how you feel when you do this, Maribon? Oh, yeah, all the time. I mean, I really... I really enjoy just w watching all the masters at work, just like yourself. And I always have like a, a notepad and a, a pen or something or, or like my Google Docs open. Uh, and I continually like figure out stuff from from these sessions. You know, I try to take away the top points and then try to implement them in my game, uh, even if it's like a podcast that I do, too. Like after I talk to somebody I think, you know, wow, like I should try this and like, let's see how that works. And sometimes even one tip is just huge. Um, yeah. So we're going to talk about these tips, but I mean, just one is just worth so much. It can save you so much time in your development. Um, so, and to help you from, you know, keeping the, you know, struggling in, in the stroke or a strategy. So um, yeah, definitely Pete, definitely. Very cool. Now I always do get paranoid on these. I think we should ask the folks if everybody can hear us. This is as long as we can get a couple people going, we hear you guys then we can kind of really uh, jump into this night and, and give you guys a lot of great solid content. Oh, oh Will, what's that? <laughs> In the hizzy. Yes, Scott says yes. All right, <laughs> look at this, cool. Yeah, so uh, people can hear us. A big shout out to Fuzzy Yellow Balls, Will Hamilton. Uh, he's actually a great friend of mine. He's a really great guy. We play tennis pretty frequently. He's a good player. We go back and forth. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can yeah. hear you. Pete. Yeah, that's, I can't say brutal. the same thing that, that you have brutal. to say, Maribon. I can't say I'm a good friend of Will. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you are. I mean, Will's, no. Will's a good guy. And yeah, I mean, guy. like I said, we, we hit in D.C. We go out for uh, food and, uh, drinks and stuff. And, uh, it's, it's great to see him on here. We'll see how long he, he lasts, you know, trolling us today. Um, but David Will's crushing us right now, but we'll, we'll come back. <laughs> we'll make a comeback. The internet troll. Very cool. Yeah. The internet troll for sure. <laughs> well, so tell, yeah. Tell me a little bit about this year's summit. What, what, uh, what are you excited about for everybody to see? How are you kicking things off tomorrow? What can, what are we going to see tomorrow? Yeah, Pete. Well, I'm just doubly, double checking my schedule so that I don't just talk out of my bum here. But uh, we've, <laughs> but we've got a, a great stuff in store for tomorrow. We have the single strategy day. So that's going to entail 
uh, having Paul Anacone, who is one of the legends of the game. Uh, he actually was a, a top player. He, he reached a career high of t- number 12 in singles, um, but he also coached uh, Roger Federer, Pete Sampras, Sloan Stevens, Tim Henneman, among many others. And he's going to talk about the top winning single strategies used by Grand Slam champions. And he's such a nice guy. Quick story. Uh, after interviewing for last him for last year's summit, I actually saw him walk into the media credentials tent at the City Open, which is where I was doing some media and where Will is also, I think, doing a great camp. And so uh, I, when he walked in, I, I thought to myself, there's no way Paul's going to remember me. He just talked to me for like 45 minutes online. Um, but, you know, to my surprise, you know, Paul immediately looked at me and said, hey, Mirabon, how's it going? And uh, just such a nice guy. And then when I was waiting for my credentials, he, had, he tapped me on the shoulder and said, take care. And so just just a great guy, like amazing. You know, I just cold messaged him on Twitter, him on Twitter. And he agreed to come on, which is very rare. So, and then we have uh, some guy named Peter Freeman. I'm uh, falling behind Paul Anacone. <laughs> you are. You're, you're becoming a legend too, man. So, uh, I'm really excited to have uh, my great friend Pete on for tomorrow. I uh, definitely check it out. And he's going to talk about the top ten single strategies for 40 plus players. But rest assured, you can follow it even if you're 15. So, um, but. These in in particular for 40 plus players are great strategies. Uh, And then, and stop me, Pete, if I'm talking too much, but no, we want uh, you to talk. I want to know all about tomorrow. Good. I'm going to have a sore throat by the end of this thing, but uh, we've got Sarah Stone uh, as well. Who's going to talk about uh, how on-court coaching principles can apply to your tennis matches. And so she's a WTA coach and she's the CEO and founder of the women's tennis coaching association. Uh, and she's coached some great players. So that's going to be a very interesting session for you. And then we have uh, Mark Sofalis, who uh, I believe it's his third time also on the summit. Great coach from Australia. He's worked with the Brian Bros, uh, the Rodianova sisters, uh, Victor Hanescu. And he's going to talk about how to develop a winning game plan, which I talk about a lot. And I actually have a, a download for creating your own game plan. But anyways, that's really important to prepare yourself before you get out on the court uh, to to just figure out your strengths and, and play. Try to match those with your opponent's weaknesses as best you can. I'll, I'll save the rest for Mark. Uh, and then we have Edgar v- Giffenig, who uh, is a great coach. He was a national coach for the USA, Germany and Mexico. And uh, he's worked in several academies. And he's going to reveal the uh, well, the top principles and concepts to help you win more matches. But the title is Practical Advice to Improve Every Aspect of Your Game. So that's what's on tap for tomorrow. Uh, so, that's, I mean, yeah. that's a great day. And that's just one day. I, I know the guy, everybody on here, if you want to see the lineup, you can scroll down. We don't want you to scroll down too long because we want you to watch us and, and what we're going to talk about tonight. But you can scroll down and see the complete schedule. And uh, what what happens, Maribon, if they're looking at the schedule, their mouth is watering, like, I'd love to see Paul Anacone, but I've, I've got so many things to do. For the people who can't tune in tomorrow, what could they do? Right, so I mean, the thing with the summit, it's uh, put together so many wonderful sessions. So each of the sessions, once they go live, they'll be, up there for 48 hours. So if you don't have time to watch all 30 or watch the ones that you really want, um, you know, the best choice for you is to get the all access pass. It's a great option. So if you're super busy and whatnot, and you can't watch Paul's uh, presentation or Peter's presentation, and you want to be able to refer back to all the sessions whenever you want from the comfort of your uh, computer, smartphone, tablet, then there is the lifetime access uh, pass option. And there's a button below if you're interested. Uh, great option. The hundreds of people have taken advantage of it, so it's 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 a good option. Um, so, yeah, that, very that's, cool. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah, I, I really appreciate everybody coming on, and uh, just want to you know this summit. I, I tried to change it up this year and bring in some new faces, as well as as well as some really great uh, coaches who were on previously. And I changed the theme to help you win more competitive tennis matches. And uh, we want to to talk to you about that. But I guess real quick, uh, Pete, I'll, I'll just mention like the different themes of each day, if you don't mind. Sure. Great. So uh, starting tomorrow, we've got single strategy. So we've got five sessions on that. And then on Wednesday, we have 
gosh, I forget already, but we have several sessions on doubles. So it's double strategy day on Wednesday. And I don't know if Will is here because I'm, you know, while I'm blabbering, I'm oh, not he's looking still, at the He's chat. still on harassing people. Fantastic. He's, harassing people. Love it. he's talking with people. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's a one of a kind. But so actually I'm live streaming with Will on Wednesday. So I'm basically picking my favorite people and live streaming with them. So it's going to be a blast with Will. I mean, he's going to be trolling me all night. And I hope that Pete can come on and all of you so that we can troll him. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he's going to talk about um, the uh, top three doubles plays you've never heard of and also answer your questions as well. So we've got a great lineup for that one, too. We've got Ian Westerman from Essential Tennis, who's also one of the best in the business alongside the two gentlemen I've been talking about all night here. Um, Gigi Fernandez as well, Emma Doyle, and uh, I'll skip the names for the rest of them. But we also have two technique days. We have several uh, technique days on the serve on um, Thursday. Um, and then we have, uh, you know, technical days on the different ground strokes and volleys on Friday as well. And then on Saturday, we have a mix of mental game sessions, which we're actually, I'm going to go, I'm going to stream live with Jeff Greenwald. That's the plan. He's uh, great. Yeah, he is great. He's fantastic. So I got a lot of questions about the mental game and what to do and, you know, playing in, in crunch time situations, crunch time coaching. And, <laughs> and when you're nervous and things like that, just like I am on this live stream. So, um, that's a great session to tune in to ask us any of your questions there. And then uh, the final day, well, actually, sorry. So we have mental game day on Saturday, as well as a few fitness day uh, sessions, fitness sessions. And then on the last day, we have uh, some more fitness sessions and a, also a very cool session uh, from a sales rep at Babel at uh, talking about uh, shoes and like the right shoes for you, d depending on your foot type and your game. So that's actually really interesting and more impactful than you'd think. So um, all that blabbering set aside, uh, uh, Pete, any, anything else to add? You, you excited for, uh, for the summit? I, I am excited. I mean, obviously that's a lot of stuff. Uh, and so great job. I mean, it was impressive as you kept going through. I'm like, wow, that's a lot of, it's a lot of coaching. So Thank you. Um, you know, everybody out there, take advantage. And I think we should probably get into our own coaching of ourselves. What do you think? Yes, definitely. Definitely. All right, guys. Well, enough blabbering for me. So um, I think, uh, you know, Pete, how, how about we have you talk about your first um, your first uh, favorite tip here? OK, cool. And then, and I know Will kind of talks uh, very similar about uh, one of the most frustrating type of players to play is the pusher, you know, the dreaded pusher. You go out there and you just don't feel like you're playing your game. It doesn't feel good. You start to get really frustrated and nervous and you notice that your, your friends are starting to watch you, your teammates are starting to watch you and your face gets all red and hot. And <laughs> like, how can you tell I've been there before too? It's totally oh, yeah. nightmare. Yeah. And, Usually our first instinct is they've got no game. I should be blowing them off the court. <laughs> and then I, I have even, when I was younger, uh, you know, used to kind of tell my students, well, you just got to attack. You just got to attack the net. You just got to take it to them. And, you know, as I get older, I realize that's not, it's easier said than done, especially if we're, we're, we're having a lot of players who are just recreational players, even myself, you know, it's not easy I'm, I'm about a 5-0 player, and it's not even easy with my skills to just blow somebody right off the court. I mean, if they're a if they're good at pushing, it's it's hard to blow anybody off the court unless you have the skills of Roger Federer. Then you can do whatever you want with the ball. But I don't think Roger Federer is tuning in tonight. And but we are no, no. <laughs> we are using interestingly enough, we're using a Fed play, and. Um, one of Federer's favorite things to do, I call the Fed draw play. And that's where he intentionally brings his opponent forward. He likes to hit a nice little short chip cross court. And he's basically daring his opponents like, this is a very uncomfortable shot. Now you've got a decision to make. Are you going to come to the net or are you going to retreat? And either way, I've got you. And, and so rather than you know trying to blow a pusher off the court, I would really look to use this play a lot. And what's interesting is one of my online members, I, I put out the video on how to how to beat a pusher. 
and he was playing so, so you guys definitely should try this because he was playing somebody he said that normally gave him fits he usually lost to and he ended up beating he ran this one play he ended up beating the guy 6161 and and all he did was rather than constantly trying to come up with all the skill you see, rather than try playing a pusher and always thinking you've got to come up with all the skill, think about it. Why are they a pusher? They don't have much skill. All they can do is bunt the ball back. You want to put them in situations where they have to create skill. And so the Fed draw play does that. It, it, it brings them short. I'm going to come here to my board. Can you see me pretty good, Maribon? Yeah, I can. So it's great. You hit a nice little short angle right here. You don't have to hit a great shot trying to keep it low and, and on their backhand side if possible. Now they've got to decide if they move up here, are they going to come in off a very difficult shot or are they going to run back? And usually the next part of the court is wide open for either a passing shot winner or you can hit even a, even a high loopy ball to the opposite corner is going to win a lot of points or at least give you the short ball you want to then attack on your terms rather than always trying to force your attack and this is just a, a great play to run that's easy to run, especially off a of pusher's weak second serve. You know, so you can kind of get in your mind like, okay, when I see this second serve, I'm going to run that play, force them to come up with skill. And the more you can make a pusher come up with skill, you're going to get a couple things to happen. You're going to get them in, in positions of the court they don't want to be in, which is at the net trying to finish. They typically don't like to be there. You're going to get them to all of a sudden get frazzled, and they're going to start to make some unforced errors when they normally don't. And you're going to get the type of short balls you want to attack on instead of always forcing it when maybe you're not really ready to attack, but you feel like you should because you should just be blowing them off the court. So that's my first play. Love that, Pete. That's a really great play. And, you know, that's the name of the game, trying to get your opponents out of their comfort zone. You know, of course, they want to just battle all day from the baseline. Let's say if they're a pusher. So when you make them hit shots they don't want to do, then guess what? You're going to throw them off. They're going to be uncomfortable. And that's when you get them. So I uh, love that play, uh, that tip. Appreciate that so much, Pete. And, um, you know, being said, that being said, uh, I now have uh, a tip that I like, I'd like to introduce to everybody. And that is to change up your doubles, formations, and plays. So, and I think Will is, is also a master of this and he's learned a lot and we've all learned a lot. But to give you a story, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was playing in a 5-0 uh, doubles uh, league, well, a USCA league, and we were playing doubles. And uh, my partner and I, the very first game that we played, we've, we got broken. The other team was just smoking uh uh, returns uh, cross court and um, they were really making us hit really tough volleys and that's not good. So, so we decided right away, look, okay, like we'd shake off that game. Next game, we got to throw them off. So, you know, first, first point, we did an eye formation. I went right. I picked off a volley. Uh, that was great. Won the point, you know, next uh, on the ad side, we, we did uh, Aussie formation and you'll learn more about that on, on Wednesday. Definitely tune in and uh threw them off again and you know we did an eye again and then the next point after that we did we we, we did regular formation and we poached and so you know when you do that you prevent your opponents from getting into a groove uh especially and this is of course again for doubles you know um if you just serve and you your partner stays in that regular spot at net and and you stay at your where you are you serve volley you let your opponents get in a pattern, you know, they'll gradually feel it out and okay, like I can return cross court really well now. But uh, if you see that happening or even before that happens, you want to try out these different plays. So then you're basically having your opponents guess uh, where he's, where is he going to be? That's the worst feeling. You know, that's who I hate to play. Like in, you know, I hate when I have my opponent serving and then the guy at the net is a really aggressive volleyer because I don't know where he's going. He's putting so much pressure on me to return at a you know a much smaller pocket cross court or he's forcing me to go for the down the line sometimes so i just wanted to you know bring that to your attention i know some of you use these plays but a lot of you especially i see at the lower ntrp levels you're just kind of chilling you know on your sides and that's fine but you know you want to try and bring you know tools to your toolkit is so to speak and so that's uh, one of my tips to help you win more matches uh, for the on the doubles front. So, uh, Pete, do you got any thoughts on that? 
Well, yeah, actually, I've got a great story on the I formation. Um, I was lucky enough to play in this tennis fantasy camp where we actually run the tennis con thing now down at Newcomb's Ranch. And I was on Roy Emerson's team, meaning that I played for him. He was my captain, my coach. And I was playing with, with um, a guy who actually became pretty good friends with that week. And we were actually playing well. <laughs> we were That was the frustrating thing is we were playing well and we were getting tuned. And um, part of the reason we were really getting tuned is, and I'll just again go back to the board. Uh, I think I'll bring the board closer. So uh, what was happening, one guy in particular was fantastic at when a serve was served that wide, he was crushing his backhand cross court. And so he was in the zone and we were playing traditional where the, you know, the, the net players here, the servers coming in, serving, volleying, and he was either just passing us outright or hitting everything right at our feet. And Roy told us, he's like, you guys should go I formation, you know, be, so I moved over here. And normally when you're thinking about that, you're thinking about, okay, well, we'll serve down the middle because if we serve out wide, you know, the, the line is wide open. And, and he actually said, no, he says, actually, most people are great great pullers of the ball. I mean, they can, it's, it's like, you know, he's hitting, he's hitting cross court. You know, people are very good at pulling the ball across their body, the opposite side of the court. And he said, he said, I bet you the way he's returning that if you start hitting actually a kick serve out there, the ball is going to be a little higher for him and it's going to be hard for him. He's going to have a hard time getting the ball down. He could just tell by the guy's stroke, I guess. And so the guy started popping the ball up down the line. So two things either happened. We either got a nice, easy, high volley when we served and volleyed and, and came to the net because basically all we did the whole time was the person I formation would just go over here and take away his cross court shot. And so when he did go cross court us, we had an easy put away rather than being a, a passing shot on us. And then we were getting high pop up uh, volleys, you know, above our waist. And so it completely changed the match around. And I will never forget that story because, you know, I, I had never really thought about going out wide and running the eye formation. And, but once he broke it down, it made sense and it worked great. Love that Pete. That's a fantastic story to add on to, uh, to this, uh, tip. So I hope that you all enjoyed that one. And, uh, Pete, I know you just, you just chatted, <laughs> but, uh, I'm going to switch it back to you for your next tip for us. Okay. The next tip is servant shade, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so one of the things that has changed in the game, uh, there's even a, a, a kind of like a little viral, depends on how big uh, nerdy you guys are as, as tennis fans, but there's this point right now online that this guy, Wes Fuller, who's uh, completely obsessed with tennis, yeah. he posted a point between uh, Borg and Velas. And one of the per people on there commented that, oh, it's kind of funny. They literally get back to the middle after every shot. And, you know, that was one of the things that was ingrained in my head so much when I was growing up is hit, get back to the middle, hit, get back to the middle. <laughs> and so, you know, no matter where you were, you were just sprinting back to the middle. And um, Will is somebody who talks a lot about the serve plus one with with uh, Craig O'Shaughnessy, uh, the stats guru. And um and so the idea is that, hey, these points are not lasting as long as you think they are. And even in recreational tennis, they're, they're three shots or less. And, and so the idea is that, that these pros now are serving and then they're shading, they're cheating over towards their forehand side. And when they do that, uh, for example, if me as a, well, I'll, I'll talk as a righty because most of y'all are, most of y'all are righties. So you know, let's just use the, use the ad side. That's a great time to serve in shade where you could, you could serve out wide on the ad side, serve your kick serve and cheat over here. And now basically, you, you know, there's only like uh, the, your, your opponent has like a 20% chance of getting to your backhand and an 80% chance you're going to hit a forehand. And if you hit a good kick serve, now they're running back to the middle fast and furious. And so you can either hit behind them with an inside out forehand, or you can hit cross court and make them run to the other side. And, and, you know, if you do that, the point, you kind of have them on a string right away. And uh, most likely they're going to miss or going to hit a winner. Or you're going to get an opportunity to come to the net. 
And so the serve and shade is a great way to start on offense if you're playing singles. Love that, Pete. I think my go-to play is to hit the uh, the kicker or top spin on the ad side and then uh, shade to the left. And, you know, just in general to give me the opportunity to hit the shots I want to hit and to kind of like figure out like first, you know, where do I think the ball is going to go as well and then shade there. So I uh, definitely, definitely appreciate that. And uh, that's a great tip there, Pete. And we will go to one of my tips now, which is to when, when you're facing a net player, whether it be in doubles or in singles, you know, my preference is to dip my returns or my passing shots and to set up the next ball. Because I think a lot of people, when they when they face a, a volleyer, they are they just they go for a winner or they try to hit to the open court. But an alternative, especially if you're not in, in the prime position to hit a great offensive shot, is to dip the ball. You know, you could even sometimes I even dip the ball with like a slice as well. Um, force, but the main thing is to force your opponent to hit up on the ball. And that way, oftentimes you can set yourself up for a better shot. You know, you'll, you'll be in better position. And so I use this a lot. I mean, I in particular, I have a pretty heavy uh, forehand. Uh, very spinny, so I love just spinning the crud out of that. I could have used a different word there, but uh, <laughs> to to make to make you know to give my opponents a lot of trouble, make them hit half volleys, make them pop it up, and then the second shot is a lot easier. So I like to do that, and that's that's one of my tips, um, Pete. Uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this one. Well, I think it's a great play. I know that I even had a coach at one point who got angry at me if I tried to pass them right away as they were on their way to the net. Uh, especially when I was growing up, we played indoors. The courts were faster, so it was a lot of serve and volley. So, yeah, certainly the, the 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 plan was to get at their feet, make them pop it up. And if you are playing doubles, you know this is when communication is so important. And so this is a great opportunity to let your partner know, hey, I'm going to go at their feet, and now your partner can start to think about really being aggressive with a poach because when when a person has to dip their head down to focus on a low volley, that's you know very hard to do. They're just praying they can get it, get it back in. And so it, it, it gives the net player uh, a real chance to cross and steal and, and put the ball away. Uh, do you have anything? Um, you have a doubles day, right? Is there anything uh, on poaching uh, for this uh, in the summit? Yeah, uh, Pete, thanks for, for mentioning that. Yes, we definitely have quite a few. <laughs> I mean, we have, uh, we've got Gigi on for a great, uh, a great session, actually an encore session. And she's going to talk about, uh, you know, double strategies and like the best positioning for, for you and, and also, uh, poaching as well and how to execute that successfully. Uh, we've got, as I mentioned, we've got, uh, Ian talking about the eye on Australian formations. And, uh, we also have, uh, Giata Storman, who I'm actually going to, be giving away a couple copies of her book today. I don't know if you could see it here, but it's doubles for beginners. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. Doubles. Looks like there's somebody really handsome going to be talking about doubles. Really handsome. Uh, he goes by the name Hill Hamilton. But boy, boy, <laughs> good looks. Yeah, no, Will, he I has... am not speaking on Wednesday. I'm Tuesday. Yeah, no, Will actually has dashing good looks. I mean, if you look at his photo, I mean, he's not in a suit like I am. We, we're actually buddy-buddy together in those two circles. But uh, he, <laughs> if you scroll down, but yeah, I mean, he's got just, I mean, perfect skin. Like his hair is perfect. It's ridiculous. Alabaster. But, <laughs> what? <laughs> it's alabaster skin. Oh, yeah, no, totally. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, Will's gonna, Will's gonna talk about it all. You know, we'll, you'll be able to ask him all your questions about doubles and other things, you know, his favorite food, his favorite drink. I mean, anything, but yeah, he's going to talk about the three doubles plays you've never heard of. And I mean, this doubles day is huge because, you know, as, as we've talked about, you know, that a lot of people play doubles. I would say most people play doubles actually, especially if you play USCA leagues, that's majority doubles a few singles courts. So, uh, you def definitely want to pay attention you know, to the, to the doubles day and really have, I mean, seriously, like notepad and paper, uh, to take notes. Cause it's going to be really hard to watch. I mean, to, to watch all of these sessions, uh, hopefully you have time. You just buy the lifetime access pass below, yeah. the video if they don't want to take notes and they just want to watch it forever. Exactly. Yeah, no, I do highly recommend that because I mean, I've, you know, there's been testimonials on, on the summit pages, which you can check out, but essentially, you know, we have a lot of people who, 
you know, they don't have time to watch all of the videos here. There's there's over 30 of them, uh, plus the live stream. So it's it's a lot of content. And there's so many golden nuggets, like I mentioned earlier, you know, even one tip that you get that you implement is going to be worth a lot in in my opinion and so it's best to have this sort of lifetime pass which you know the button is below where you can refer to it anytime you want so you know maybe it's june or july and and you're having some trouble with your uh with your serve and now you have uh three or four sessions here that you can go back to and diagnose so it's definitely worth it i mean even ha having uh, taking a lesson from one of these great coaches here is it costs way more than than the price of the all access. I just fast. went down to Rick Macy's and gave him five hundred bucks, and and the trip cost me like a thousand dollars. So yeah, or, I mean, yeah. and that was worth it to you, right? It's worth it. I'm I'm gonna and I'm getting a lesson with uh, Jeff Greenwald. I'm paying him a good amount of money and Mark Kovacs. Uh, so yeah, these guys literally are hundreds and hundreds of dollars an hour, and mm -hmm. and so this is great stuff, and and. Uh, and I'm having, I'm making a new course and they, they, I said, Hey, I'm going to come down. I want a lesson from you. And you know, I want to pay like a regular customer and, and they are not cheap. So it is great stuff. So great job, Maribon, putting this all together. Yeah, no, I appreciate okay. that. Okay. Uh, should we go to the next one? Yes, let's do that. Okay. I'm excited because we're talking about doubles and this one works for singles and doubles. And, uh, I got this from the great John Newcomb. Uh, if you know John Newcomb out there, put it in the, I remember growing up, I, John Newcomb was a famous announcer and he made these Canon commercials, uh, but he was quite a player. Actually, you can go to YouTube and watch him win the Australian Open against Jimmy Connors. Uh, there's a debate. He says he's won 24, no, 25 total majors with singles and doubles and Joe, uh, Drucker, Joel Drucker, who's a tennis historian, says, no, he's only 124. But uh, either way, that's uh, 24, 25 more than I'll ever see. <laughs> but uh, he, classic Aussie serve and volley player. And one of the cool things he did is he had a junior play in a game against another junior. And his go-to play, his go-to serve, which is going to work great in singles or doubles, is serving into the body. And... You know, I was a serve and volley player, and I served some into the body. Um, but you know, I was oh, I was always looking to get people off the court, which which is still a great play. It's a great play, and it opens up the whole court. But you know, that puts a lot of pressure to hit corners. And I liked how his thought process was like: if I get it into the body, because think, think about that: if you, if you get it into their body, they're going to have to pop the ball up. And, and you're going to get a volley above your your waist and up around your chest area. And so that's a great thought to have on big points rather than thinking you've got to ace them out wide or hit or, or serve it down the tee and, and, and ace them that way because you're, you're either going to miss lots of times or if you don't hit it perfectly, now they can, you know, lengthen out their body. It's right in their wheelhouse like they're kind of hitting a home run off the tee. And you can get crushed if you make a little mistake where if you're going at the body, it's a great way to make sure you, you, you know, you, you make a lot more serves and you can get a lot of easy first volleys. So that's a good play to run that, that a lot of people don't really think about, you know, as a weapon serving at their body. Yeah, no, I love that play, Pete. That's uh, just fantastic. I mean, that's that's like one of the hardest shots to return. You know, I mean, I think I I, I personally call that play a lot, and I use that uh, in singles a lot as well. Um, you know, you're taking away their ability to hit, to hit angles, and uh, and yeah, it's it's a tough shot. So, uh, appreciate that, Pete. That's a great tip there. And uh, so here's a tip for me, which I mentioned earlier, but I, I really don't think we think about this enough. And I'll give you some context even for me, because I used to be a type of player who I would just totally grind points out. I mean, that was my strength. and still is my strength. You know, I just use my speed and uh, my heavy strokes and I wouldn't really be thinking out on the court. I would just simply be reacting all the time to my to my opponents, just trying to make one more ball than them. And, you know, that's fine. And that works, but up to a certain point. 
And so what I want you all to do is to try your best to play to your strengths and exploit your opponent's weaknesses. So what I mean by this is let's say my strength is my forehand and my movement. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to set up the points that I can hit as many forehands as I can. I mean, that's what I do with Will. Otherwise, I'm in trouble. But, you know, like that that's that's what you've got to do and and utilize your strengths. And, and then also, you know, you really want to try to analyze – uh, as best you can, what types of balls the opponent has trouble with, uh, what's their weakness, you know, do they have bad volleys or, you know, uh, rusty volleys, or do they have a weak backhand? Okay, let's set up the point. Let me hit a couple cross-court forehands and then hit the next ball uh, to the backhand to set up the short ball, you know, things like that. So we want to really be able to use our strengths as much as we can and exploit our opponent's weaknesses. And then also with that, I mean, it goes hand in hand to develop a game plan beforehand. So you want to be thinking about this before the match. And especially if you know your opponent, then you can assess both, you know, your strengths and the opponent's weaknesses. If you don't know who you're playing yet, then obviously you think about your strengths. And then, you know, during the match, that's when you kind of figure out what types of uh, shots that they don't like to hit and so forth. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's really important to be thinking out there about your strengths and your opponent's weaknesses. So uh, anything there to add uh, about that, Petey? No, I, I, know I, think, I, Petey. I, I, I do have something to add in that um, one, of, one of the best lessons I heard was from Jorge Capistani, who talked about, you know, especially going with your strengths and your opponent's weaknesses. Uh, so this is one of the things I'll just kind of use one of my tips right now because it piggybacks on what you're saying is that look at your opponent, look at their, uh, again, I'll, I'll treat myself as a righty, look at their forehand side, look at their backhand side and start to grade them from A to F, you know? So like how they hit below their knees, uh, would you give them an A, B, C, D or F? Uh, same thing uh, from their knees just below their hips, their, their hips right below their chest. Now this is area three, it's what Jorge calls area three. And this is usually where most people end up hitting the ball to people. And this is where people really like it. And then up here is zone four. And so for instance, many people may have a great, especially let's say they have a, a you know, forehand killer forehand with a, with a semi Western or full Western grip. They may love it up here, but let's say they have a one hand backhand. They may be a disaster up here high. So, you want to, as you're warming up and playing your first couple of games, grading your opponent A to F and then going, okay, these are my strengths. That's their weakness. I'm going to go and just attack the crap out of that weakness. And, uh, and it can be a nightmare for them. Hey, we did get a question and I think it was a good one. So I'm going to, yeah, sure. Feel free. Uh, one of, one of the, the people on the stream said, what do you think about beginners playing tournaments mm -hmm. and, um, I think it kind of determine. It, it depends on a couple of things, I think, and then I want to get your opinion. One, um, if you're really excited to go play competition, uh, like Will said, why not? Why not just go for it? Um, but if you kind of have, you're kind of like self-conscious and, and, and you have to be honest with yourself. I mean, at certain points in my life, me, my ego has been very fragile. I wouldn't want to go out there and lose O and O. And if you play a tournament, you know, sometimes you don't know who you're going to play. You could play like somebody like you who's just starting out uh, and you have guys have a great match or you can go out there and literally lose O and O. And if you're OK, if you're going to wake up the next day and be OK with losing O and O and you still think it'd be a fun learning experience, then I say go for it. But um, if you're not OK with that, then it might be better to just still work on developing your strokes, your technique, get a little more solid and ready for match play. What do you think? Yeah, I agree with that, Pete. I would just say for sure, if you're a beginner, uh, you can play the tournaments. And uh, but but the the main thing is to really be analyzing and figuring out like what can you do to improve because you just don't want to play tournaments, play tournaments, and then ingrain you know bad habits, and then all of a sudden, oh gosh, like I've been hitting like a terrible backhand, and now it, it's going to take me a long time to fix it. So you just want to be aware, and I think it's really important. Uh, as early as you can that to get a good coach that, you know, you can, can guide you. And so you play a tournament, Ho hopefully you can, like, this is an ideal world to take a video of it, or you have somebody watch your coach watch, and then they can tell you, Hey, you know, your footwork on such and such 
shot isn't optimal and let's work on that. So that's, that's kind of what I would say just to be, be careful that you uh, don't ingrain bad habits, but um, you know, competing is fun. So, uh, so yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Do you want to go next or shall I go next? Uh, I guess I can, uh, I can go next. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Sweet. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so I, I really enjoy, and I think this is really important and all the pros have this basically uh, a routine before playing. Okay. So I have a morning routine. I have routines before I play tor uh, tournaments and matches. And it's really important because you want to get yourself into a, a rhythm and get used to, uh, you know, the, the same types of, uh, you know, I'm, I do first, I take a, have a jog and then I jump rope and then I do some dynamic stretches, you know, things like that. And then I play, you know, you don't want to one day you're stretching and doing all these things. The next day you're running on the court because then all of a sudden you're going to be thrown out of whack. So it really helps to get you acclimated and get you in a comfortable zone to just do the same things every time uh, and to feel confident. And so I really encourage you to, to develop a productive routine that you have uh, each time before you're playing a match. Um, that's definitely something that I did not have before, but now I realize it's importance and not just for tennis, but also my, uh, daily, my daily life. So, uh, definitely highly encourage that, you know, you can also do incorporate things like visualization right before or a few minutes before or whatever, or meditation. So just stack a few good habits that'll get you primed and ready to play. And, uh, that's, that goes into the preparation, uh, you know, aspect of it all. So that's something I like to do. I mean, Pete, do you, do you have a routine or, or ones that you have your, your students uh, follow? A couple of them. And I've gotten, uh, from, from great coaches, you know, that that's why this event that you're putting on is so powerful because a lot of the tips that I give as a coach are, I'm not reinventing the wheel. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing something from somebody and going, wow, that is really great stuff. And so here's a couple of them. Number one, uh, Roy Emerson, who is one of the greatest players of all time. He won 28 majors. Uh, I think it was 14, uh, was it no 12 singles and 14 or is it might have been 16? I don't know. Anyway, he, um, he talks about going flat to the boards, mate. You know, like when you go out there and play, he, he would always say to everybody, he's like, go out there and go flat to the boards. And what he meant by that was as soon as you start playing, your feet should be going crazy. You know, you should be super, you know, without, without, um, you know, there's, there's a fine line between being too amped up as far as, you know, overhitting. But, um, and I'm going to give you a tip, which is my next tip, how to not overhit, but really move your feet. Uh, but, you know, when you go out there in a match, sometimes, especially if you're waiting around or you're nervous, you know, you can tend to kind of like kind of go out there and ease your way into it. And that's not how Roy Emerson did it. And and it was funny after he said that to me, I got to interview John Newcomb a couple of days later. And in his interview, he without any prior knowledge to me talking to Roy about this is John said, when you played Roy Emerson, you were almost always down 3-0 because he played those first three games like his life depended on it. So, I mean, if you can go out there with higher energy, because a lot of people, when they when they go out to play a match, they start, act, they start trying to act like they're not nervous. So they kind of have this little too cool for school look about them, you know, and, and acting like, oh, everything's fine. And they, they actually end up looking and playing lethargic and I think they're really just trying to hide their nerves rather than using those nerves for a lot of energy. And, and so you want to do that. And then my next tip to follow along with that, I got from Nick Saviano, who's coached like I think over 50 WTA and ATP players. He coached Eugene Bouchard, which she should have never left him because she was on fire. And, and I got to watch him talk one time. He says, when you go out there and you start playing, say to yourself 100% with your feet and 50% power. And so you're moving your feet at 100%. And he said, most people do the opposite, especially men. He's like, men will go out there uh, and hit 100% power and 50% with their feet. I've seen a lot of players I give lessons to. I, would, I think that's giving a lot of credit. I would say most people are like 25% with their feet. So you go out there, you're moving your feet, you're really focused on your split step, but then you're focused on hitting the ball 50%. And every time you're hitting the ball, 
you say to yourself over the net and in. So you're giving that positive uh, affirmation and, and, and setting up a target over the net and in. And it is a great way to go out there and, and play some great tennis. Love that, Pete. That's a great, great tip. I really appreciate that. And yeah, I mean, in a lot of matches where I tend to fall off is that I'm not using my feet enough. So I, you know, for whatever reason, maybe I freeze or something and I'm, or I think about the points too much and the, the, you know, the importance of them. And then all of a sudden I'm, I'm thinking about more about my mechanics and things like that. But I think the most important thing really in those situations, especially when you get nervous is using your feet, uh, the most. So, uh, I, I really like this hundred percent feet, uh, tip here, especially, uh, it's, it's, it's really good. And I think it's applicable in many situations. So, uh, good stuff, Pete. Uh, should we go okay, to one of, yeah, go to one of yours. All right, or sweet. Let's see. So, um, my next tip here is to play every point like it is match point. And, uh, actually, uh, you'll hear about that in the summit. One of our great coaches talked about that and, uh, essentially, it's really upping your intensity because you see some people and I've talked with Pete about this, where you kind of like feeling your way into the match and you're just kind of relaxing. But I think, you know, it, my opinion and Pete can chime in on this is to really have your intensity up. And like, like Pete just said, have your feet moving, you know, just play with a sense of urgency because it's really going to help you. I mean, this comes to mind and maybe kind of a random thought, but you know, when you're, when you're playing in practice, sometimes you're, you're kind of relaxed and you're not moving your feet as much, but then let's say you're in like a huge match all of a sudden, then you're in full intensity mode, but you want to be able to do that all the time as much as you can so that you get used to ha having that sort of intensity. And so that's not something different that all of a sudden, Oh, I've, now I'm going to turn it on when it's really important. You don't want to be that type of player. You want to be somebody who's, who's like a, I mean, I think of a Nadal who's just moving their feet intense intense and uh, playing every point like it's their last. And so that's something that, you know, when I heard it's, it stuck with me. And I think it just more than ever, anything, really, it's just very motivating as well to just, uh, to just grind at every single point, run for every ball. I mean, that's what you see the best in the world doing. Um, that's why they're able to get those incredible, seemingly impossible, uh, like gets, you know, shots that are several feet away. They're just, they're getting them somehow. And that's because they're playing every point like it's their last. Otherwise they would, say, oh, you know, I'll let this one go, you know? So that's not, that, that's not conducive to uh, getting ourselves at our, our peak levels and, and maximizing our, our performance and capabilities. So uh, Pete, anything on that? Yeah, I mean, first of all, one of the people that you interviewed, Rick Macy, actually had a sign on his fence and it says run for every ball. And uh, one thing that is interesting is I think, and I know a lot of people on this call tonight have a very big advantage that they could have that they're not taking advantage of in matches because if you're on this call right now, you are not a normal tennis player. You know, most, most normal players at your club, they don't even know about online instruction. They're certainly not spending their uh, Monday night at, at 9.48 p.m. watching something like this. And so when I find that, I find that, that they tend to, a lot of people come visit me, they take their fitness, their nutrition, a lot more serious than the average club player. So, you know, if you're somebody who's 40, 50, 60, 70, that you look around and you go, well, all, all the people I play against, I'm in way better shape than them. You should be taking this mindset to the court because what happens is I'll look at somebody in, in recreational tennis who's got, you know, maybe 20, 30 pounds to lose and against somebody who is, looks fit as a fiddle and they're both moving their feet the same amount, which is not very much. Now imagine if you're that person who's in great shape, not only are you gonna get to more balls, but you're gonna, you're gonna have what I call the Rafa effect, which is intimidation. You know, Rafa is so fit and so intense that the people he plays against they start to go for more shots because they're afraid that if they don't hit the perfect shot, he's going to run it down and hit a passing shot. They start to question themselves if they can mentally and physically hang in there with such a guy. So if you look around and you're like, well, I'm fitter than everybody. If you're not using that, if you're not figuring out a way to use that to your mental advantage, 
then you know you're leaving one of your biggest assets on the table there and and usually when you can do that to people make them go for shots that they don't want to go for make them question themselves if they really want to be out there with you um, you know, you're probably leaving a good 10 to 12 points every match on the table. If you're not showing that, if you're not enforcing your will physically on people, if you have that ability to do so. Yeah, totally. Totally. I really appreciate that. Uh, you know, the addition to, to that point and, uh, super important stuff there. So Pete, with that, I'll, uh, kick it back to you, my friend. Okay, well, this goes back to, um, and, and I think maybe as I'm doing this, because we are at about an hour, I, I want to wow. make sure that people have a chance to ask questions. So maybe as I'm doing this, guys, you can start to think of some questions for Maribon and myself. Yeah, and I about see a bunch point. already, too. Um, yeah. Do you want me to, to you want to go on with your point and then I'll ask you them, or do you want to just go from now? Well, let's, let's go, let's cover a couple of questions and I'll go over my last tip. All um, right. So, um, I apologize. I'm, I'm going in reverse order kind of just cause it's easier, but, uh, uh, Neymar asks, uh, Neymar Marcus. No, I'm kidding. It's a terrible joke. Uh, what is the best secret to play and beat lefties? <laughs> oh no. Yeah. Have, we we want to beat you. I'm a lefty. We want to beat you. Well, Okay, a couple a couple of tips to beat a lefty, and this really hurts me to have to do this, but I am I am a coach now and not a player. So, um, one of the things is 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 lefties love to serve out wide. So if you're playing somebody who loves to serve out wide, and 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 even Federer didn't do this for the longest time, and all the announcers would say, why doesn't Federer get in the alley, and also not only get in the alley, but you kind of want to. Um, you kind of want to shade your body like you're a basketball player. So you really take that angle away. It's very hard for lefties to go down the middle. So now you're going to get balls like trailing. Uh, it, it, you know, you're going to return their out wide serve easier. That's one. You're, so you're taking one of their biggest weapons away. And then if, if they start to try and go down the middle, a lot of the balls are going to naturally hook into your forehand. And so now all of a sudden you're starting to take, a uh, big advantage and you're starting to make the lefty miss a lot more serves. That's number one. Number two is you have to recognize that you're playing a lefty. I can't, I, I can't tell you how many times I've played a match and the person keeps getting content staying in this cross court rally with me to where I'm getting to go my forehand to their backhand. And cause you're just used to doing that. But, and that's, be, and that is a big reason why I think because lefties are kind of spoiled in a lot of matches, they get to go forehand to back him and look at, look at, look at what Nadal does to Fetter and not enough righties pick up on that and make it and, and, and switch up the point and bring it down the line and now reverse the order to where now the, the lefty has to make a decision. Are they going to go their backhand or their forehand? And then as they do that, as you hit that and change that, you know, you might want to play like a little bit of Pete Sampras, a little bit of possum, especially if you're fast and and not, you know, normally you would kind of come over here, but you kind of stay hanging out over here and because lots of times the lefty's not going to hit. They, lefties, I think, have a lot weaker backhands than maybe even righties do because righties are used to having to defend that backhand a lot. And so very low chance that the lefty's going to come over here and just hit a bunch of winners on you cross court. Lefties usually like to take their backhand up the line. And so you can kind of cheat there and then you can come either with an inside out forehand for a winner, or you can bring it back inside in and still make them hit another backhand. And uh, if you did that to me, I wouldn't really like you very much. <laughs> Good stuff, Peter. Appreciate that. Uh, let me read another question if that's all right. Um, this is from Robin NBK. Uh, and she asks, I think she, he or she, what are the best times to go for more challenging shots versus just playing high percentage tennis? What do you think? Did Pete? you want to take that or you want me to take that? Yeah. Uh, let me, let me try to take that. I mean, I think, uh, more challenging shots. That's a tough one. I mean, I'm more of a high percentage player myself. I mean, by challenging shots, that kind of makes me think of like really, low percentage shots. I mean, is that kind of what I'm trying to decipher the question? Like, is that what you're kind of getting Pete? What do you, what do you think is being asked? Well, I think maybe they're asking when should you play it safe versus taking a little bit of a risk is what it sounds like. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, you want to, you want to play it safe. Let's say if you're playing, 
you know, somebody who, you know, makes a lot of unforced errors. I mean, that that's, that's obviously a time where you can play it safe. You might want to go for more if, if you're comfortable and if you're playing somebody who, you know, you know, that's the type of style that you're going to need to beat them. Let's say they're really consistent and they're getting everything back. So maybe you need to hit more penetrating shots. And so that's maybe a time that you want to go for more. Uh, maybe you want to, let's say, play serve and volley because you recognize that, hey, they're slicing some their their back end returns or something like that. So you kind of just have to figure out, you know, the, the, the opponent you're playing and, uh, and and what might work best. So, Pete, I don't know if you have anything add, to add to that. I really like your idea about, you know, they slice a lot of returns, you know, maybe on the back end, it's a great time to serve by. That's a great one. And then I'll just add one uh, point uh, is also court positioning is a big determination of, you know, if you're going to play it uh, more of a rally ball or if you're going to take more of a risk on. And uh, there was this thing called system five. That I know Nick Balateri talked a lot about back in the day where basically when you're back here off the court, you're in area five. So that's when you should be hitting the ball. So we talked about what area you're in should be kind of like the height of your shot. So if you're in area five, you should hit the ball a level five over the net, meaning very high over the net and, and usually cross court. Um, if you're in area four, you're basically like right on the baseline. And again, now your level of, of height over the net is about a four. So you're looking at, you know, four to six feet over the net and usually cross court. And then in area three, this is the first time you can start to think about challenging, <laughs> challenging your opponent, maybe switching the direction. So maybe, maybe taking some risk and going up the line, but your, your height is still three over the net. And then as you get into area two, usually as you get into area two, this is the point where you are definitely going to come to the net somewhere in here. Now it almost makes less sense to retreat. So you're going to come into the net and, um, depending on where you're on the court, it makes more sense to cross court or, or, or down the line. And then once you get to the net, now you're in area one. And usually that means you have to win the point also in one shot. You know, if you're not putting the volley away in one or two shots, you're probably going to lose with a passing shot or lob. So um, that's another way you can kind of determine how risky you're going to be. And what, what, where did you go to Disney world since I left? I did actually, you know, they, they made, they made the Concord jets. Uh, they, they brought it back and I took one. Now, I mean, the thing is, you know, Ian Westerman, uh, another good friend here, he, he said, Hey, what kind of live stream is this? Will not seeing any Snuggies. So I tried to find what I had and I have this nice little Disney hat. I've also got my friend here, this moose. And, uh, I just wanted to do what I could to please Ian because I know, he has a lot of childhood dreams that he left behind and you know, I just got to give him some love here. So anyways, <laughs> that's going above and beyond as I, yeah, I, 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 I'm just going crazy. It's, it's late, I guess, but no, uh, that's great stuff. Uh, Pete, I think we want to get in your, your, uh, your, your tip here on, on helping us become better competitive tennis players. And then maybe we'll go back to questions if we have some time and I'll ask a couple of quiz questions to give give out uh got his book here so you want to go for yours oh, cool you got a giveaway okay yes i'll do this uh, as quick as i can uh, now when i was growing up bud collins was one of the most famous announcers i think he people either loved him or hate him but he said one line that really stuck with me he's like tennis is boxing without gloves and as a as a kid who was growing up playing tennis i kind of like that idea because uh, you know lots of times when you're a tennis player, you get viewed as, oh, that's a that's a wimpy sport or whatever. So I like when he says it's, it's box without gloves. And then as I coached, it, it took on a completely different meaning because I do think in a lot of ways, tennis is like boxing. It's one-on-one. -on -one. You're, you're, you're strategizing the whole time. It is a physical battle. Uh, you're, you're trying to look for weaknesses and probe. But <laughs> obviously, boxers have much greater survival skills in the ring than we do as tennis players for obvious reasons. If, if a boxer is not noticing a tendency or a move as early as possible, they're not picking up on things with just the slightest little look or, or body move. If they don't read those right away, they're on the mat. They're literally getting knocked out. It physically hurts. They're going to regret it. So their learning curve for when they make a mistake is much faster than a tennis player. And, what I notice is that tennis players are more thinking about their strokes and how their strokes feel. And they're not 
out there in survival mode uh, enough. I think I think if you can start to think of yourself as a boxer and literally every time you see that ball being hit a winner on you to think, you know, that you kind of just got knocked out, you know, but thank God you're not actually getting knocked out and put to the ground. But if you can start to, to more notice what you're doing. So like as you're hitting a shot, kind of like as a boxer is throwing a punch, a boxer is going to notice as they're throwing a punch, oh, this feels good. And if it connects, they kind of know how their opponent's going to react right away. So as you're hitting the forehand and as you're hitting it, you should be telling yourself, oh, I think I see this early. I think I'm hitting it well. And then, you know, as you're hitting this, as soon as it's leaving the strings, you should start to expect a certain reaction. Like if all of a sudden you hit this great shot and you notice that your opponent turns their back, you should be cheating into the net to go put the ball away. Um, one of the things that happens so often is you'll hit a great shot and then the ball bounces twice in front of you. I don't, I, I mean, has that ever happened to you? I can't tell you how many times I see it happen in lessons when we're playing points and you see the ball bounce twice right in front of them. And you might think, Oh, my opponent is so lucky. What a lucky shot. When in reality, what you just missed out on was your reward for hitting a great shot. You, sh you know, the pros, you never see the ball bounce twice in front of them because they're playing for money. They're playing at a high level. They think more like a boxer. And so they know right away when they hit a great shot that they know when the weak shot's coming back. And so you're never going to see the ball bounce twice in front of them unless it's an amazing drop shot that was intentional. But if they hit a great shot, they're they're right on that ball as it's bouncing and putting it away. So, you know, think like a boxer and try and get that same survival mode. Uh, kind of like Maribel was saying earlier, play like it's, you know, your last match, like it's match point. Awesome stuff, Pete. Appreciate that. Uh, that's great stuff. So let's see. Uh, do we want to take another question or what do you feel like doing, uh, Pete? I know it's uh, past 10 already. <laughs> I say we go, I say we go pro the prize. I say we, we yeah. you, do your, you do your quiz and then maybe we'll a answer a question or so. And, um, and then everybody's going to pick up their lifetime access pass before they go to sleep tonight. Yeah, I think that's uh, the the prudent course of action here. If you want to have a library of like awesome material to just refer to over and over again, I mean, I know I love enjoy enjoy, uh, you know, going back to whenever I have issues to check out the lifetime pass. Go to whatever section I'm having trouble with. Oh, I'm having I had a bad doubles match. Let me check out uh, what uh, Ian Westerman said uh, to to cause chaos against my opponents. Things like that, which is exactly what I did a couple weeks ago, as I mentioned. So. Uh, great, great idea there. So let's see. I, uh, all right, let, let's, all right. So we're going to give away a couple books again. I'm going to bring it up here. It's called on the ball doubles tennis tactics for recreational players. And uh, this is from Giata Storman. And thanks again, Giata. I really appreciate it. Uh, and definitely check out her session on Wednesday as well. Uh, and it's going to be a great one on, uh, doubles plays. So, um, let me ask you all this, and the first one to type uh, in the winning answer will get it. Where is Andre Agassi's father from? What country? Ooh, that's a good question. You do know the answer to all these, right, Maribon? Or... <laughs> I'm just trying to figure it out. That's why I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. No, I do. I do. Ho, ho we have a winner here. Alex or Beta. Well done, my friend. Iran, well done. You're a winner. So he gets the book? He gets the book. Well done. Um, do we, I just do want to give you a prize, or is that it? No, no. <laughs> I'm going to give another one out. I just want to ask you because you are the guest of honor here, Pete. Is there a particular question that you want to ask? That or do you just want me to ask? No, I, I mean, want you to ask because I think because you're prepared. I'm. I, I would take. Okay. I, I don't want to hum and haw. So keep going. Okay. Oh, and by the way, so uh, if you're a winner, please email me at mirbon at tennisfiles.com, and uh, please include. Well, I'll correspond with you, but we're going to need uh, your your shipping address. Um, and thanks again, Giata. I really appreciate it. Uh, definitely, everybody check out the book when it comes out. So uh, this next question, this one is pretty tough, I'd say. So you might get a few guesses. Who won the ladies' 2000 Wimbledon crown? So who won the ladies' Wimbledon championship in 2000? I'm clearly using the internet here uh, for, for this one. but uh, No Googling, see. guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't Google. Only me. It's the first one to answer, Mr. Bagelmeister. Uh, Nebula did not. Oh, 
Jules. Did she get it? Jules wins. Venus. Well done, Venus. Nice. Well done. Please email me at mirabon at com with your shipping address. If you don't, then I'll, then you won't get the book, I guess. Isn't that um, amazing? You got, you got Venus who's still playing and then Lindsay Davenport's there, Steffi Graf. Uh, it's amazing how long those Williams sisters are still going at it. It's crazy. Yeah, it, it really is. Um, let's see. All right, let's do one more. Um, okay. Yet has been so kind here, uh, and again, uh, on the ball, look out for it. So, who won the the men's tournament uh, recently at the Madrid Open? Oh, fastest Google search wins. <laughs> Will Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Did they have a junior tournament there, Ian? Oh, Josu. Josu wins. Yep. Yep. I mean, well, well, I don't know. He didn't spell it, spell it wrong, right. Man. He didn't spell it right, Pete. What but do we now do? It's all going fast. So you got to give it to him. All right. Joe, Joe Kakiv. <laughs> I'm sorry, Josu. I'm just playing around. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. But uh, Josu, please uh, send me an email at Mirabon at tennisfoss.com i repeated it once again i'm sorry uh with your shipping information okay cool um great answers here uh some very trolly ones here for you mainly from our fellow instructors but uh great stuff so pete what else you got any any comments anything i think it was a great night and i want to thank everybody for coming on it is awesome to do this. It's just so fun to see everybody having fun. And um, I want to thank you for putting this together. It's a lot of work. You do a great job. And uh, I encourage everybody. Here's here's one thing I'll say just to kind of, because um, Maribond's very, uh, you know, he's he kind of, he's not going, you know, where, where I think he should go. Where, where, hey, guys, get this. Because I just had a guy, Omar, um, he he was losing matches match after match and he's one of my favorite online guys and he said that he went back into three of my courses and reviewed them he went into break their serve break their spirit anticipation and another course he said after he reviewed them he went out and he won a match seven five seven five and he said he's particularly struggling to win close matches so, you know, you've got the best coaches in the world right now that Maribond's put together for you. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that you just don't want to watch once. This is a library of just gold waiting for you. So I would encourage you to get the full lifetime access pass. Um, you know, Maribond, you are just a great guy. You, you're always just so nice and humble and, and, uh, do this out of, you know, uh, it's in the right place what you're doing. And I, and I think you're awesome. Thank you so much, Pete. I really appreciate it. And I, I do really highly encourage you to get the pass. And I mean, Pete's really right. I mean, just to recap what you get to, uh, you get lifetime access to all 30 plus sessions. You get also every single one of those sessions, you're getting an MP3 file for that. So that's basically a downloadable audio file where you can upload that on your phone. Like I personally love to listen to, uh, to audio files when I'm driving, when I'm doing the dishes, cooking in my room, things like that. So you not only get the videos, you also get all the MP3 files. You also get a Tennis Summit 2019 implementation worksheet because what we're all about is to have you actually put what you learn into action. So you you watch the sessions, you look at the sheet, and then you you fill out, you, you follow the steps, and then you have an actionable plan for for improving your game and winning more tennis matches. And then you also get exclusive access to the Tennis Summit Mastermind community, which is our Facebook group, where you can ask us questions. And, and we have a community of really passionate tennis players. And so you get not you also get that. And then you also get uh, some study guides and resources from our fellow uh, speakers as well. So you're getting a lot of stuff here for this all access pass. And I really highly encourage you to check it out because I mean, it's going to be really tough to watch all of these awesome sessions and there's so much material in there. And I think that if you just, you know, you pay basically what you're going to pay for one lesson and you're getting like, I mean, really like a thousand dollars or so even more worth of value here with all the videos, five uh, MP3 files, 
the worksheet, um, the access to the, the exclusive uh, Facebook mastermind community and the resources from our speakers. I mean, that's a lot of stuff that you're getting for, for this price below. So I, I really do highly encourage you to check out the all access pass. And you're going to do that by just going below here and uh, clicking the button. And I highly encourage you to, to check it out. And uh, it's, it's really, really important for you to be able to refer to these things um, whenever you, whenever you come across a problem or when you, whenever you want to improve something. I mean, I know what I'm going to do actually right after this summit is I'm going to go and dive deep into, you know, each of these sessions, I'm going to take notes and then I'm going to be you know talking about this information with my group. Um, and so I think it's going to be awesome to see you in the community with me and also our coaches too are going to be there. Um, and yeah, it's just super great value. And I can't thank Pete enough. I can't thank all the coaches enough, uh, Will and Ian and, and Gata that were in here. Um, thank you so much. And uh, just, you know, it's, it's definitely the right move if you want to improve your tennis game. So, yeah, awesome stuff. I can't wait for Wednesday. I'm going to come hard after Will. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to be trolled like crazy. Yes, please, Pete, like scrap whatever plans you have, you know, please just, just make it. And I hope that Ian comes too. Uh, Ian, you, you got to watch the sessions. I mean, I'm so excited. Tomorrow's going to be awesome. Paul Anacone, uh, Pete once again, and, and so forth, Mark Sophilis. And then Wednesday, another huge lineup. We got uh, Ian and Will both here. I, uh, I've got Will on the live stream, Gyata as well. Thanks for coming. And, uh, and we've, we've got it all, man. We've got single strategy, double strategy, two days of technique, mental game, fitness, um, you know, whatever you need to improve, we've got it. So I uh, highly encourage you to pick up the lifetime access pass to maximize what you learn on the summit and uh, overall just to, just to join us and watch the sessions and have fun. All right. Very cool. Thank you so much. And everybody enjoy tomorrow. Yeah, everybody enjoy and uh, we'll see you on the next live streams. And uh, Pete, I appreciate it. Uh, as I always like to say, you're the man. Uh, you're one of the best in the business and uh, you really have such a great passion for the game. And uh, and, you know, the, also, you know, Will and Ian are just doing amazing things as well uh, in the tennis world. And uh, shout out to Gata too. So thank you, oh, Pete. Hey, you know what I forgot to add? What? Anybody who buys tonight gets oh. tennis on one for free. Oh my gosh. Dang it, man. We forgot to add. <laughs> That's insane. So basically, uh, Pete puts together incredible, like uh, also online tennis conferences too uh, in the fall. And so he put together TennisCon 1 with some incredible speakers on there. And Pete, if you want, you can name some. And it's, it's <laughs> I mean, for you, if you get the lifetime access pass tonight, you're also going to get access to all of those incredible presentations, yeah. right? Yeah, TennisCon one was great. We had we had um, Nick Ba Terry and Paul Anacone and uh, Ian, of course, was on. I mean, all uh, Jeff Saltenstein, uh, all of them were gr great. You know, a lot of the people that you're going to see in this summit are also also did the TennisCon, and uh, it's awesome stuff. Uh, so, uh, my coach from uh, my junior days, Rodney Harmon, who got to the quarterfinals of the U.S. Open, played Jimmy Connors. So, uh, and he's got a sick kick serve. So anyway, take that. It is getting late. So you guys enjoy tomorrow, get some good sleep and, uh, we will see you tomorrow. Okay, guys, take care and, uh, tune in to the summit starting tomorrow. Take care, everybody.